Hello and welcome to this week's Serious Information Security Seminar at Purdue University. Our presenter this week is David Zage from Sandia National Laboratories, who will present what does knowledge, discovery, predictability, and human behavior have to do with computer security. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zage, a Serious graduate, back to Purdue. Thank you for the introduction. So as you said, my name is David Zage, and I'm with Sandia National Laboratories. And today I want to talk a little bit about how knowledge discovery, predictability, and human behavior, or so how some of these social aspects actually impact what we do in computer security, and how by taking into account these type of things, we can do a much better job at securing our systems. So as a little bit of background, many national security problems are actually, um, we try to solve by making predictions about behaviors of individuals and groups and trying to accurately interpret these behaviors and how they impact the behaviors of others is critical to understanding these problems. Uh, we devote vast resources in trying to understand these problems as well as trying to understand the social processes behind them, but often the predictions are poor. Um, kind of like as you see in the graphic on the right hand side, you know, it's the next version of the Trojan horse, however this one looks like an elephant, so we're just going to let it on through. Um, so this kind of leads to the question, uh, are there predictable things in human behavior and it, is it predictable in general anyways? So the objective of this talk is to provide a theoretical and empirical evidence that the failure of standard prediction techniques is not due to the fact that human behavior is inherently unpredictable, but by the fact that we are, one, um, basing our prediction on features that actually do not have predictive power, and two, that the difficulty of measuring many of these things was given by the fact that you know, we needed a lot of processing power, we didn't have the actual data we needed to understand processes at hand. And given the fact that now we have a lot more computing power, as well as we have a better understanding of many of the social processes behind them, we can actually look at if we can do a better job of predicting what's going to happen. So as a quick outline, we're going to look at some of the social groups and look at what intrinsics versus actual social influence and some example results. Um, look at er evolutionary uh, adversaries and some sample results there. And finally look at if we can do a good job of looking at individuals and doing some prediction about the movements and habits of individuals. And this is uh, work with some colleagues at Sandia Lab. Um, and so there's a variety of information here. So if any time if you have questions, please feel free to ask. So the first topic we're going to look at is social dynamics. Um, people often pay attention to others. While we all like to claim that we're our own person and this type of thing, we are often very heavily influenced by those around us. Um, even little kids, you know, down two, three years old, will try and walk like their parents and grandparents because they think it's the cool thing to do. Um, as well as we have often obtained benefits from coordinated action with others. For example, if I'm the only one that has a fax machine, I know it's a little bit dated, but if I'm the only one that has a fax machine, it is of no use to me. So in other words, I want to have as many of my friends to have this cool invention of the fax machine so that way we can actually exchange information with each other. So this way we actually obtain benefit by interacting and watching the social behaviors of those around us. We also use um, behavior of others in order to infer information we might not be able to uh, be able to actually get it directly ourselves. For example, if we're in a new town and are trying to figure out which restaurant to go for in the evening, we might look at the restaurant, say in Chauncey Hill, and go, where should I go? If all the restaurants have almost nobody in it and one is very crowded, I will often choose that as the restaurant to go because that seems like the hopping place. Now, is this the right way to actually go about deciding that? Well, that's a different story. Because oftentimes, what we think are good predictions are not necessarily what make a good predictive measure. For example, just because there's a lot of people in there, they might actually just be the workers are having a break and sitting down in the chairs, and the better food could actually be had at a, at a different restaurant. So it's the idea that in these situations, the intrinsics or the uh, quality of the choice is not um, often as influential as the actual social influences of those around you. 
So as another example, I mean, oftentimes a better quality product will go out of business or uh, the company will go bankrupt be just because some other company got the social buzz. Um, so if you look at Apple, you know, they have all their products out there. They have the iPod. They have the Nano. Other companies have tried. They might actually have a superior product. However, they don't have the social influence behind them in order for these products to actually become very popular. While there are these type of things, and despite the fact that many of these things, that, these intrinsics that we try to use to rank and to identify inf information and uh, ideas behind how we make decisions, these are often not the best ways to predict behavior. Um, another example of why these intrinsic ideas that we think are good for predicting are actually not as good as we think can come to actually movies. So how do movies actually decide who to star in their movies, how their movies are going to be successful, and you know how much to pay the actors. Well, they look at the movie reviews and the revenue. They say that, okay, movies that have George Clooney in them grossed a lot of money, and that, on average, that a movie that has George Clooney in it makes 1.4 times the amount of money that a movie that doesn't have him in it. They take their data, do a standard linear regression, and avoid the fact that there's actually a heavy tail distribution. So what this does is it actually skews their answers. And so what they think are these intrinsic values that are predictive are actually very, have very little predictive value to them. Um, so for example, the, if you take into account the fact that the data is actually skewed, George Clooney has a multiplicative, um, uh, additive, or multiplicative effect on movies of about 1.03. So in other words, the movie makes 3% more than it does if it's not in him. And the fact that most movie studios then pay him 20 30 million, as well as some portion of the revenues, means they actually lose money by basing their star choice on these type of metrics. So in other words, what do we have to do? Well, we need to refine our understanding and how we actually gauge how we actually pay the stars. So we need to understand better of how to actually gauge these social influences about what actually does make money. So if the intrinsics aren't very predictive, what can we do? Well, here we actually are looking at using network dynamics or features of the networks and how people interact, actually interact to have greater predictive power. So we actually look at networks at three different scales. The first being the micro scale. So in here we look at the degree of the nodes. So perhaps those that are highly connected to others will have a large degree of influence on their choices and what they actually do. The second is more of mesoscale features. So in other words, communities. So I am in a community and I actually pay a lot of attention to those around me. But outside of that, I really don't care what people do. You know, so if I like golf, I'll pay attention to what Golf Digest says, but I won't pay much attention to what other sports magazines might say because I have higher faith that their information is correct and they are in my social circle. And finally, we look at some of the macro scale features. So over the entire graph, how do these features and you know, how does information actually disseminate across the entire network? Um, so we actually want to look at how do these type of features in a graph help the predictivi predictivity of what we choose. We actually want to do some formal modeling based on reachability in order to determine if we start in an initial state, will something actually become important? So looking at the left hand side of the graphic, which go into a little bit more detail in the next slide, you can see that you have a set of states and you're looking at the reachability. Can I go from the green initial state to the red viral state. So in this case, would something like a movie or a social meme actually become important? Well, we can actually do some predictive measures on the network structure or due to the network structure and do a much better job of predicting whether or not the, a meme or a tweet or something that's socially related will become important. Additionally, we can look at this or base this on the structures kind of as you see on the right hand side the idea behind these structures is what is actually important. So if we look at the top, we see two graphs. One, you have all the red nodes are concentrated in one community, and in the other, they're kind of spread out. So while it might seem intuitive, the fact that we want you know, 
a strong set of people in a community to kind of go out and evangelize. What actually works better is to have a diffuse set of people across your communities, so across these mesoscale structures, in order to disseminate the data better. So you can kind of think of that you have one evangelist in each community to go out and spread your word. As well as we looked also at the core and periphery structures of the network to, do, to determine whether or not things are reachable. And using these structures, you can actually find, and this one's actually somewhat intuitive, the fact that those that are in the middle of the structure and often highly connected are actually much more influential than those that are on the periphery of the structure. So those that only have one or two connections don't actually um, result in much productivity. Now, in order to actually look and see what is predictive, what's actually done oftentimes in the past is I set up a set of states and I run a whole bunch of experiments and simulations in order to see if I can reach from the beginning initial states to the end states. Well, while this is interesting and oftentimes has some merit, it is oftentimes very compute intensive and very dependent on what variables you want to look at. So in here we're actually looking at how to do this in a formal method. And we actually do this by looking at predictability as a reachability problem. And by reachability, I mean, once again, can I reach from the green start state to the red state of interest? Um, and we do this by trying to find a function called an altitude function, which basically says that if I can find this altitude function, I can determine whether or not green is reachable from red. So for example, and I'll get a little more detail on the next slide, but if I find an altitude function A, for example here, which is denoted by the line that's now drawn across the graph, I would say that no, I cannot reach from the green to the red states. So in here, I wouldn't have to worry about will a meme go viral or will this information spread beyond its local community. Uh, so you, when we do this by actually applying a knowledge discovery techniques. Um, now there's a whole bunch of technical details to this. I'll go over just some of the key points that are more interesting. And if you want to actually know more, I can talk to you more later um, offline or after the end of the talk. Um, so the predictability is actually given by the stochastic process at the top of the slide. Um, and so the theorem actually goes in the fact that if I can actually find an equation that's bounded by gamma, so by, bounded by gamma so of, um, based on the initial states, and then bounded above by one on the actual um, undesirable states, which is here denoted by xr, as well as is a non-increasing uh, function, then I can actually determine whether or not I can actually satisfy and reach from the initial states to the actual undesirable states. And now the trick is actually constructing this function. And until recently it was thought that this was actually, um, or it is actually NP-hard, but the fact that we actually can use um, semi-definite programming to actually come up with solutions and there are actually new toolkits available that are freely and publicly available to all of us to actually do these types of programs, we can actually come up with interesting and novel solutions and actually construct A of X. So what do we actually do with this? So given a model, so given a network, and then the connectivity of the network, we actually apply knowledge discovery, which um, basically we solve the previous set of equations using a sum of squares, and we feed this into both the data we have and what we think are the predictive features, and we actually do machine learning on it to do, at the end, final prediction. So we use the network structure and we learn over the network structure. And then given this model that we actually extract from the structure itself, we apply machine learning to do better prediction. Um, so for a concrete example, we actually looked at memes. So memes are social uh, social communication, usually across Twitter. So what's popular right now? So these are things that are hot for this week, but not for the next. Um, so we actually looked at some of the U.S. political data because there's large amounts that were collected from the last election. And some of the memes that are very popular were things like lipstick on a pig and others, things that were similar to describe Sarah Palin. And then there are other memes like, hey, um, hey, can I call you Joe, which didn't really catch on. So how can you tell if a meme will actually catch on or not? And that's what we actually used um, the previous two slides to actually construct a model and to actually determine what actually caught on. Um, 
Now, in order to actually figure out what features we're actually going to look at, we can actually look at three different sets of features. One being a language-based, and language-based is typically what a lot of people have used in the previous or in the past. So, for example, will lipstick on a pig become interesting or important? Will I take all the tweets that had that term in it, I look at the terms associated with that, I look at the language associated with that, and I see if it's positive or negative or whatever, whether it's emotion is something that says that this will actually become interesting. Um, so language can be based on both emotion via the a new lexicon, which is basically a lexicon of a thousand words that they gave to a thousand people and said, what do you think about these? Do they make you happy? Do they make you, or do they make you happy? Do they make you sad? As well as sentiment. Are these things positive? Are these things negative? And that's an actually lexicon that's available from IBM. Um, we can also look at simple dyna but dynamics, such as the number of posts. So if you would think intuitively, the number of posts, the more it's posted, the more popular it will be, and the more popular it is, as well as the post rate. So the more it's posted, you know, hopefully we can get something that will grow exponentially, and that will become a very important social meme. And finally, we look at the network dynamics. So both the community dispersion, so how spread out are the people that are interested in this, as well as the K-Core of the blogs. So K-Core is defined by the number of um, nodes that you're connected to that have the, sim uh, have the same degree as you. So you do this by actually determining that you find a graph, you take all the nodes with degree one out, and that's the k-core of one. You do the same thing iteratively for each nodes that have two, three, four, and those have the different cores. So those with a higher core should be of more influence. Um, so in order to actually learn, we used ensemble decision trees. So basically, our, you know, the decision trees are built, and it determines whether or not these are important memes. Um, we had taken some of the classifiers that we saw on the previous slide, and we used these to actually uh, as input for the, uh, for the actual decision tree and learning. And then we classified whether a tweet was successful if it had more than 1,000 posts and unsuccessful if we have more or less than 100 posts. So obviously we are doing uh, post-processing of this so we know what is successful or what is not. And so we're seeing if we can actually automatically and, deter and determine which of these will actually become viral or not. Now in order to actually estimate the prediction accuracy, we do 10-fold cross-validation and we do it with 100 successful means and 100 unsuccessful means. So in other words, we split up the sets into groups of 10 and then rotate which ones we actually learn on in order to make sure that we don't bias our learning um, and don't basically learn the hypothesis that we're trying to test. So our results kind of uh, show at the bottom of the slide the fact that the most predictive features we actually found are one, the early network community dispersion. So ex I'll show that a little bit in the next slide. The K-Core activity, the number of posts, and finally language. So what would intuitively have been used in the previous or in the past, which is the language, is actually found to be the least predictive of the actual features that we used in order to actually determine which of the memes will go viral. As well as the fact that we looked at the amount of information that we used in order to actually construct which uh, construct the decision trees. So if you use language only, you get an accuracy of about 66% or slightly better than you would if it was a random guessing. But as you use more information given by the tweets and the connectivity and the graph of these tweets, you find that you have your accuracy increases um, as you find it for more information. So for example, after 24 hours of tweets and the graph of the connectivity between these, so which authors reference which authors, you find that you actually have a 92% accuracy of the estimation of the successfulness of the tweets. Um, another thing we actually looked at in a, in a similar vein is blog posts. And in here, the blog posts are uh, two different sets. The first actually being about the Danish cartoons when there was actually um, when it incited uh, violence based on the fact that they were cartoons of Muhammad, as well as those um, looking at blog posts about the Pope lectures where he had referenced incendiary material about Muhammad there also. So we were actually looking at of why was one event uh, caused a large reaction where one event basically had no reaction at all. And what's actually interesting is by using the mesoscale um, 
measures that we actually looked at, so the community structure and the community dispersion, we can see that the Danish cartoons, which actually had a very large worldwide reaction, had a very wide dispersion over the blogs as well as the tweets that we looked at. And we can also see on the right-hand side that the entropy or the dispersion of these tweets across and blog posts across cyberspace and across domains and communities is rather large and that's the blue line and you can see that it increases until there is actually legitimate violence um, perpetrated on the streets and uh, so this is actually really interesting the fact that uh, as the entropy grew the the actual blogs and tweets became much much more important so this said we had a lot of deceptive groups that were very interested in this one topic uh, if we look at the Pope lectures on the bottom of the slide, we can see that the entropy remains low from pretty much the entire um, time that these were actually blogged and tweeted about. What this says is that one group was rather interested in it, but other than that, no one else took or paid attention. So in other words, that this tweet and these, this topic would not go viral, or would not become an important or successful meme. Um, so the next topic we'll actually look at is looking at how adversary co-evolution co actually impacts uh, cybersecurity. Um, so oftentimes if, when we collect data, we find that the way we collect data is agnostic of an adversary. So we um, assume that the data gathering process is completely independent of the actual attacker. And these type of um, assumptions are often incorrect. The co-evolutionary arms race between adversaries is often central to many things we do in cybersecurity, in terrorism, or even things like commerce. You have marketing, finance, you have market forces, and you have you know, you, you try to actually out outbid or outwin your competition in order to actually to have the best products. So we conjecture the fact that if we can actually take this into account and we can actually gener generate dynamic structures, we can actually exploit this fact and actually make proactive defenses that are effective against both current attacks, so ones that we know about and are easy to categorize, as well as future ones. So for example, if we can actually see what current denial of service attacks look like, we might not actually know what future ones will look like, but we will still be able to actually effectively defend against them. So there's actually some previous work in this area that says that things like non-transitive games, so a non-transitive game is one where it says that A beats B, B beats C, but not necessarily A beats C. So the very prototypical example of this is rock, paper, scissors. And the fact that if we try to actually react to these type of games, we will actually come to basically unpredictable dynamics. So if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, we try to actually learn based on um, the non-transitive game and by learning on this we basically learn nothing. You can see that there is no equilibrium and that the what we learn and what we try to do will just fluctuate wildly. Now if we actually do proactive learning so we actually try to learn the dynamics beforehand and we take these dynamics into account we can actually extrapolate what the uh, attacker's behavior will be in the near future and actually can do a much better job of reacting or actually defending against him and mitigating the attacks he can do. So for example, if we look at the picture on the right hand side, and these are more just graphics that kind of um, illustrate the point as opposed to actual um, real data, but the fact that given this little network, if I can learn on it and I can be proactive, I can actually come to a solution where I can actually reach an equilibrium. In this case, I can reach an equilibrium and that means the attacker is largely ineffective. So we actually look at this in terms of um, cyber defense. And so we actually have looked at transfer learning. So transfer learning is actually a new graph-based technique in order to actually take information that's known about one domain and bring it to another domain that's closely related but not identical. So for example, if we look at the graph on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a domain uh, of instances that is denoted by the green circles. So this might be current attacks that we know about or current 
ideas or current um, ways that attacker might try to get into a system. So some are labeled with plus, some are labeled with a minus. So the minus might be ones that are ineffective and plus might be ones that are effective. And then you look at the features. So we can look at, okay, what was it about the systems that allowed the attacker to actually get into the network? And so we can see that some of the features are actually labeled with plus and minuses. And so here we are able to show that, okay, given the fact that it had this feature, it was actually what made the system vulnerable to attack. And the other ones were, even though it had this feature, it didn't really matter. So can we take this knowledge that we've learned and actually transfer it to a new domain that's similar but not quite the same. So if we have the red domain or on the right hand side, can we learn what we need to know without having to have a person actually go in and tell us this is these are the attacks, this is what needs to happen, and here's how you defend against them. And while we can actually do this, oftentimes it is very expensive to do and costly since it takes you know, a system expert and it takes a lot of time to actually determine what the attacks are as well as the fact that many of these attacks happen in real time and so we want to be able to respond quickly and not respond, you know, six months down the road. So we actually looked at um, using the KDD Cup data. So this is a very classic data set of data which has a hundred different uh, network, or this has a thousand different network uh, traces that where there's a thousand that are actually benign network traces, there's a thousand that are denial of service, and then there are a thousand that are remote access. So in other words, a unauthorized user is trying to actually access the data. And then we actually have a set of unlabeled attacks or un unlabeled instances of network access. So can we actually learn which ones of these uh, network accesses are good access versus bad given what we have in the past? And oftentimes, What's interesting and what's even more important is we can actually show with the trends of learning is that we can do this with minimal amount of pre-labeled data. So oftentimes you, have, you need 50, 100, 200 instances of previous attacks or previous uh, things to actually learn on where we can actually learn on a few, a few being 5 to 10. So if we look at the graph on the right hand side, you can see that there's two sets of line lines. Basically the red and pink ones at the top versus the, um, let's see, does that actually show on? Nope. So you have the red and the pink on the top versus the green and the black on the bottom. And so the green and the black, oops, I guess they're black and, black and blue? Yeah, so they're black and blue. So the black and blue lines on the bottom are actually your traditional learning techniques. So things like naive Bayesian learning and uh, other things like um, regularized least squares learning. And so these are what are typically done in terms of intrusion detection and things like that to actually learn what the attacker might do to in order to defend against unknown attacks. And you can see that the efficacy of actually predicting and then mitigating the attacks and identifying them increases as the number of training instances increases. So if, as you start at zero, the effectiveness is about 50% using traditional learning techniques. And so, in other words, it's just a random guess whether or not the uh, network traffic is actually attack or not. And as you get more, as you get into 40, 50, 60 actual instances, you can see that the efficacy raises to about 80%. So in other words, it's able to actually correctly classify about 80% of the network traffic as attack or non-attack. However, using the actual um, transfer learning, we're actually able to detect that near 90% of what the network traffic is, whether it's actually an attack or not. And what's interesting to note, and what's important to note, is the section there of 0 to 10, where we can actually do much, much better than traditional learning techniques. And this is actually really important because for most security applications and most uh, cyber forensics and things like that, you have very few actual instances of attack data and very few instances of labeled data. Because once again, labeled data is very expensive and hard to come by. And the fact that we might even know we're being attacked, so how can we use that as one of our instances? So the fact that we can do this on almost no labeled data means that it's a very useful technique in actually defending current systems. And what's also interesting too is if we look at the graph on the right or on the bottom right hand side, you see um, basically two sets of bar charts and they're labeled um, D, uh, DOS and um, R2L. So basically, denial of service 
and remote ac and remote access. And then you have the two bars, which are LO and LL. So um, LO is basically using a lexicon only to try and to um, identify uh, basically the attacks here, and then using the lexicon and transfer learning to actually do this. And so what this means is the fact that if we look at the graph, what we're actually doing is we're removing all labeled instances. So all the top instances are left unlabeled. And the only features we actually know about are some of the features that are actually labeled based on the lexicon. And we can take this lexicon, which was done using the KDD cup, to actually look and identify new attacks. And then given the um, uh, transfer learning based on that, we can actually do about 80%, so actually I correctly classify about 80%, even though we have no labeled instances. So this is a far jump from the previous techniques. So not only can we learn it to do uh, things like attacks, we can also look at some proactive cyber defense. And so here we actually look at how can we defend against spam. And so we all know that spam is an annoying problem and that as we try one thing, spammers will try another. So, you know, we do naive base filters. They do things like replace letters, put in pictures, and that type of thing in order to actually get around our filters. So what can we actually do in order to kind of stop this arms race, or at least to play it on a more even field? So what we do is we assume that the attacker actually knows we have a spam filter running, and you know, more or less assume that it's a naive base filter. And then the attacker will actually try and manipulate the email messages. So in other words, they'll do pictures and replace letters with numbers to actually defeat the filtering. And as we all know, this actually works very well in practice for them. Um, but what we will actually want to do is do proactive spam filtering. So we actually want to generate some synthetic spam by extrapolating from their methods. So in other words, taking spam, doing some of the methods that they do by actually replacing you know, some of the letters, some of the numbers, so replacing E with 3 and all those typical techniques and tricks they use and then to actually learn on this synthetic data. And by learning on this synthetic data we can do a much better job of predicting what future spam will look like and then using this in order to defeat future spam. Um, so we train the filter on both the real current spam and the synthetic you know, po potentially future spam. And if we look on the left hand side, DS3 is a typical spam filter and there it's just a normal filter based or uh, using just the normal naive Bayes learning. And we can see that you know, obviously we want the non-spam to be classified as non-spam and we want the spam to be classified as spam and we would like the other two categories to be as small as zero. So in other words we want the false negatives and the false positives to be about as small as possible. And we can see that while the non-spam and the non-spam is about correct, you know, 524 and only two that are misclassified, we can see that the non-spam and spam is actually, uh, or the, the spam that's classified as not being spam is rather high. And this is due to the fact that the naive Bayes filter cannot by itself actually detect uh, the new synthetic spam. However, using the synthetic spam, we can see that if we actually train the proactive filter with it, it can actually classify correctly the majority of the new spam that is seen. So in other words, it keeps the same performance as far as the non-spam goes, but even when you're seeing the new spam, we, we actually correctly classify the large majority of it. Only 40 or so are incorrectly classified. So one of the last things we kind of looked at in terms of some of the knowledge discovery and using some of these social behaviors and social patterns is, can we actually look at the predictability of a single individual? So while people you know, have some belief that groups are predictive and that we are influenced by those around us, can we actually do prediction on a single person and is this actually useful in any sense of the, in any sense of the word? Um, since they aren't connected to a group or they aren't connected to something that might give us more predictive power. Um, but we also, you know, obviously I wouldn't be telling you about it if it didn't actually have some interesting results. 
And so there is actually a significant uh, predictivity, predictive power that can be gained by just looking at a single person. So we actually took some uh, cell phone data that they had collected um, with a reality mining study at MIT. So basically they gave 63 people cell phones and told them to walk around and always use this phone. And basically they recorded their position, their phone calls, and a whole bunch of personal data and logged it into a database. And now this data is available for people to use in order to do experiments on things like mobility. But here we're actually looking at can we actually do some user tracking and identify users. And the pictures on the right hand side are actually movements of users. You can see that a lot of these users, even just by uh, a lot of these movements, by just looking at them, seem to have some patterns. And you know, this gives us some hope that we actually have the ability to do prediction. So the actual approach we use is we modeled the sequence of locations based on the cell tower ID, so how close they were to certain cell towers. And then um, based on these cell towers, we, we use a simple Markov chain. And the, each of the states is given by the, um, a 5 gram of the location, as well as the nearest um, four towers. And then we use this model to basically look at, can we tell something about uh, the between individual predictivity. So can I tell which individual is which, and can I tell them based on their travel patterns, as well as can I tell within individual predictability. So given an individual's travel, can it be predicted? And so very sample results, and these are just, you know, done a few weeks ago type of thing, that basically 54 out of 63 individuals can be reliably identified via the model trained. So this says that yes, humans are predictable in their patterns and I think this is an intuitive sense but not something that's easily shown as well as the fact that um, within individual predictability it says that most individuals can be quickly identified via the model so basically 79 percent can be identified given only three trips so that if I know that you go to the supermarket you go somewhere else and go to one of the location I can tell with about 80 percent accuracy which individual you are given the trip as well as some of the parameters about the trip. Um, and so that kind of concludes the talk and some interesting ideas. And these are a variety of ideas that we actually work on at Sandia, um, just for the fact that I think they're very interesting and they have a lot of applicability to a whole bunch of domains in cyber and cybersecurity. Um, just in a, and I'm going to take like two minutes to do a quick overview of Sandia and a labs. Um, there's about 11,000 of us doing um, cutting edge work at um, New Mexico, or between New Mexico and um, Livermore, California. Um, there's about 8,000 regular employees and we have an operating budget of about two billion dollars. And we have, um, at least as of 2010, about 16 percent were actually in a CS or CS oriented domain. Um, and what's also really cool about the labs is we have a lot of cross-disciplinary research and then we have computer science, materials, engineering science, electronics, nanotechnology, high-performance computing. So if you're interested in anything that do, does with science and technology, it can probably be found at the labs. So are there any questions? I know it's uh, probably a lot of data to kind of take in, but are there any questions? Um, anything I can answer for you? Sure, no problem. Um, in unpredictable di 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 dynamics, you say you basically can't learn anything. Is that similar to a three-body pro problem they face in physics because they're not really re re related, but you're trying to learn? So, um, so you're, you're asking about... Um, so I, I guess, which one are you actually asking? I'm, Trying to determine which one you're actually I, I, about. I'm trying to uh, see, uh, I guess, the difficulties you're having with the mechanisms with unpredictable di di dynamics when basically you have three cells and they're not talking to each other. Right? Did, did I understand that correctly? Um, I'm, I'm still, not, still not connecting with you here. Um, give me a little more background. Or which, which slide was it? Um, it was towards the beginning, or um, I guess it was kind of in the middle, uh, where you talked about proactive learn, learn, lear, learning and. Uh...
Or is it just gotta go further um, back? Yeah, back. Uh, no, uh, you, where you had the that graph, that one. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about. So th one of the problems with uh, that often comes up in the fact that a lot of the interactions between like an attacker and a defender is the fact that you are, it's a non-transitive game. So you get into these cycles where that A beats B and B meets C doesn't imply A beats C. So you know, rock beats paper and or yeah, right. Right. and but so, um, and so the fact that if you try to always learn and react to these type of things, you'll learn something that doesn't have predictive power for the next thing you see. And so you basically you have to keep learning and you basically are always playing catch up. So you're always reacting and you're always changing. So you never actually learn a model or a a way of defending against the adversary that actually has predictive power to the future. So if I if what if I if I learn that, you know, paper covers rocks, so paper always wins. When someone pulls out the scissors, my strategy doesn't work anymore. So now I will learn the fact that scissors always win. So once I switch to always doing rock to beat the scissors, then the adversary changes. And so this is what happens is you have this always changing and always unpredictable dynamics in your system. And so the fact that if we can actually learn what the adversary or have an idea of what the adversary is going to do beforehand, we can do a much better job at going, okay, here's what I need to do. Okay, if I learn that if I see, you know, rock this time, you know, this is just an example, that probably paper or scissors is coming next, I'm not going to do um, paper or, or something like that. Okay. So it's kind of, basically it's almost like you're doing intelligence right, on right. the adversary. Okay. Right. So it, it's trying to actually take into account the way, you know, this game that we play with the adversary right now, and oftentimes we play catch up, you know. They attack the system, we patch it. They do something else, we patch it again. So can we actually do something to get ahead of this? And so this is you know a first step into to those type of solutions. And you know I don't want to always have to react. I want the adversary to react to me. Thank you. So you, for the problem of going from some start state in a, I guess a graph to the the viral state, mm -hmm. to bring whether that can happen or not. So there's some function that defines how, I guess, uh, people might communicate on this graph. So th there's some function there that you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. How do you create that function? What's some intuition to how that function is created? Because that's supposed so, to represent. So the idea is you take, I mean, it's so basically you take your features. And so uh, what, you know, the, I guess the features are somewhat dependent. This is where the person comes into play. You take your set of features that you think are important. And then you, what typically happens right now is I go, here's my uh, data set, and here are the three features I think are important. So if it's movies, here's the, here's the gross, and here's the actors, and will this get me from a start state to an end state of making money? And so I run a whole bunch of simulations, and I see, does that actually get me there based on the fact that um, you basically define any, uh, a set of uh, matrix equations in order to determine um, basic equations similar to this set to determine whether or not I can actually get there. And the reason we're actually looking at these equations is the fact that I don't have to do the simulations. Um, I, can do, I can actually show you some more of the equations offline because they're actually uh, somewhat complicated, but they're interesting in the fact that given these, they're actually all solvable and it's all so a solvable set of linear equations. And it's actually really neat in the fact that Given the equations, once you actually define what features you're going over, you can actually apply it to different domains. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>